Hi, everyone. I am Connie Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, and this is What's Happening, which is our weekly online forum where we talk with a variety of guests on a whole spectrum of issues, and it is always a, a great conversation and, and lots of good information. And um, if you have questions or if you have comments that you want to put in the comment section, we will get to those later. Um, but I am excited to have Representative Jennifer Confrest, who is the um, House Minority Leader and newly elected in the office for um, just um, a month's time. And so we're excited to have you, Representative Confrest. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, thanks for taking the time. I know you're super busy and you're all over the state and it's been amazing to watch all of the things that you have been doing, at least through watch it through social media anyway, which is, thanks. you know, how we know things are happening. Right. Yep. And, um, and so I, I not everybody knows you yet. Um, you're new into the position, and, and certainly folks around the Capitol know you quite well, um, but not everybody around the state knows you. And so I just wanted to give you an opportunity for you to tell a little bit about yourself, whatever you want to share about family and job and background and all of that kind of thing. You bet. Absolutely. Settle in for my life story. Um, no, I won't bore you with all the details. But yeah, I, I've grown up mainly in Iowa. Um, I went to kindergarten in Fort Dodge, first and second grade in Webster City, and then third grade in Florida, then came back up and went to Johnston High School the whole rest of the way. So I like to think of myself as an Iowan who snuck away for a little bit. Um, and I have, I went to college at Drake. I went to Drake for undergrad and graduate school and then um, worked all over, you know, worked for Fannie Mae for a while and then um, worked for Economic Development Authority and Alliant Energy as some clients for a company. But sort of the heart of my career has been at Iowa Public Television where I worked for 12 years. So when I was there, I worked on all their communications. I was responsible for making sure you knew when Downton Abbey was on, making sure you knew, um, kids knew when Clifford was on. It was a really great job. And then I was never gonna leave unless I got to go teach at Drake because I really love college students and watching them grow and develop and learn. And um, then I got a chance to go teach at Drake and it was too good to pass up. So I moved over to Drake. Um, I teach in our journalism school. Um, I moved over in 2013. And that's where I've been um, since then. And I teach public relations courses, news courses, and then I developed a major called strategic political communication that is designed to help um, people become better advocates um, for a job, for a living. And that's campaigns, government affairs work, and um, lobbying. So um, all of those realms. So I um, live in Windsor Heights. I represent Windsor Heights the Polk County part of Clive and the North part of West Des Moines. And um, my husband Lee and I just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. So we're about as old as Interfaith Alliance, I think, <laughs> and our marriages. And um, certainly not us, our marriage. And uh, we have two kids. We have a, um, a daughter who's a senior, going to be a senior at Notre Dame, University of Notre Dame. And then we have a son who's going to be a sophomore at the University of Iowa. So um, to replace them, we got a pandemic puppy. <laughs> that's pretty much all I can tell you. But um, I decided to run for the legislature in 2015 because that was the year that um, Terry Branstad vetoed some school one-time school funding that schools really needed. He vetoed it on the, the eve of the 4th of July. And it just infuriated me because I had been a volunteer in my kid's school and PTA. And then my daughter was really into debate. So I was a debate volunteer for four years and judge. And I really saw what schools were um how schools were hurting financially. And so I decided to run for office to um, try to make a difference. And I ran in 2016 um, and lost. And uh, then I ran again in 2018 after the legislature gutted collective bargaining, which they had not mentioned once on the campaign trail. Um, I decided to run again pretty quickly after 2016 um, into the 2017 cycle or session. So then I ran again in 2018 and I won. I definitely prefer winning over losing. But I think that bringing that perspective of having lost a really high profile race helped me um, get a little more grounded, helped me understand sort of what what happens when the worst could happen happens and how you can survive it and move on. And I think it gave me some resilience that set me up nicely for this job. So I, I wouldn't trade it. Um, it was an experience I wish I didn't have. And I'm glad I did, if that makes sense. Um, so sure. that's kind of me. I'm, uh, you know, just love living here. Love living in central Iowa. So. 
I, I think that um, one of the most important things that you said in all of that, besides the legislative pieces of, of it, is that you help children to view Clifford. So that, that's a, right? one of my favorite shows. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I have even, don't tell the kids in the room, I've even been Clifford before. Oh, so, very nice. The Iowa State Fair. Very nice. I'm just saying. Other duties as assigned. Yeah. <laughs> when Clifford didn't show up for his shift, I became Clifford. <laughs> you, that is awesome. Little known fact about yep. prisoner of Jennifer Confress. Exactly. Um, so besides the, you, you told the great story of how you decided to run for office, but um, even before that, you were interested in, in politics and obviously creating the degree that you created at Drake. And so how did you become interested in politics? So my dad was a reporter. He covered the Iowa legislature um, from 1980 until he retired in 2012. And he also covered presidential campaigns, obviously, when they came through Iowa. My dad was Mike Glover, who was an Associated Press reporter. And um, I used to come up to the Capitol with him when I was little and hang out during spring break. And so I got to be on the floor of the House of Representatives and get to know what it was like back then. So I got interested then. But my first ever political involvement was in um, eighth grade. My minister from Plymouth Church, Faith Foray, Mm -hmm. uh, took me to my first ever um, political event, which was a pro-choice rally um, before Election Day in 88. And um, I was awakened with the idea that my voice could be heard and could matter and people could collectively gather to influence change. It was life changing. So then I um, before that, I had done things like I was a junior delegate for Jesse Jackson at the uh, caucuses in 1988. Um, and then uh, I just got involved then and just started, you know, really volunteering and learning more. I volunteered a lot on the Clinton Gore campaign in 92. And then I went to work for Senator Harkin's DC office for a summer. And then I worked on his reelection campaign in 1996. So um, I kind of feel like it was in my blood a little bit, mm -hmm. but it all really started in middle school. And just totally enmeshed in all of that is politics. And and I'm glad you mentioned Reverend Faith Foray. She's one of my always one of my favorite people. She passed away a couple of years ago, and yeah. um, she was actually an associate minister at a church that I attended as well. So I've known her for many many was years. She? And I actually clerked for her husband, Representative Mark. Mark. Yeah. yeah, yeah, back in yeah. back in the day. So anyway, I love that. I, well, Faith, yeah. um, this will be quick, but Faith uh, confirmed me. Um, married us and baptized both my babies. Oh, so awesome. yeah. it meant a lot. She meant a lot to us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so shifting from your personal life, you were just recently elected as House Minority Leader for the Democrats, the first female in that role. And um, so I have a, a couple of questions related to that. How are you approaching that role as you as you have um, dived in in this short month? And um, as a woman, do you think that you approach it differently? Um, and then kind of what do you bring to the table in in that regard? Sure. Um, the way I'm approaching the job is sort of, I'm, I keep calling myself a lean in leader. I'm really trying to lean in when it comes to, let's try it. You know, I'm, I'm new enough. To Oop. We lost your sound, Jennifer. We lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, my phone got a call. So, um, but yeah, I think that um, if you can, you know, I, I think I bring in this attitude of I've not been here when things we've tried before haven't worked. And so I'm ready to try again or try new things. Um, and again, I, I really do believe that experience of having lost an election brought me this let's just try it perspective. So I really I'm trying new things. I'm trying to push people. Um, I have one goal, and that is to get to the majority. That's my only job in the minority as the minority leader. And so 51 is the number that I keep floating around because that's how many we need to be to the majority. 10 seats, 51 members. And so um, I'm just really trying to get everybody laser focused on that goal and everything else we do needs to feed that goal. So I'm bringing that to the table. The woman thing, as they used to say, um, <laughs> the um, fact that I'm a woman and what I bring to the table in that role, you know, Connie, it's fascinating. I have almost all male staff. Yeah. And um, so they're great. They're wonderful people. But it's fascinating how often I'm the only woman in the room. And it just, you know, as women, we, we sometimes take it for granted. And then we get hit in the face with it like, oh, my gosh. And I've done a couple speeches where I'm the only woman in the room. And yeah. it's surprising um, and noteworthy. But the word that's been used most to describe me to my face anyway, since I got this job is direct. 
And I don't know if that's a word they would use about men or not. I don't know if they mean it as a compliment or not, but I'm 47 and it's who I am. So it's just going to have to be how it is. But I do wonder sometimes about the gender descriptions. I've had a lot of um, uh, retired men who work in this business who have reached out to me with lots of advice. Mm -hmm. Maybe they always do that. Maybe they don't. But I'll take all the great advice, but I am working in a very different world than the house in the 80s, you know. And so um, I, I just don't know. So I'm trying to just give everyone the benefit of the doubt and uh, prove anybody who thinks that, you know, a woman can't do this job wrong, obviously. Um, and then uh, finally, what I bring to the table, you know, I've supervised employees over the course of my career. I've worked in state government. And um, I have been a targeted candidate, which means that they thought maybe my seat would flip. And I've also been one who wasn't targeted. So I know both of both sides of that relationship with candidates. And then I just think I bring kind of a common sense, let's just try it perspective to the, to the table. And um, so far, anyway, people appreciate it. At least they haven't told me they don't. They might be chattering over here, but I haven't gotten back to me yet. So, so far, so good. <laughs> And I appreciate what you have to say um, about the, this new experience that you have as a woman um, and as a person who works at that intersection of religion and politics. I have often found myself in that um, that situation where you're the only female in the room and, and it is an interesting um, place to be. And also I think language does matter. And so I, it'll be interesting to see as you, um, move along in this this job kind of if that language changes and I know as a journalism person um, I'm sure that intrigues you as well and 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 the words that are used and um, descriptors that are used particularly so absolutely words matter is our family motto because my husband mm -hmm. also has a journalism degree and my kids have been um, you know had the power of words you know being into them since they were babies and um, and I just think that and I'm trying, I got to tell you, Connie, I'm trying not to be overly aware or sensitive of it to it. Do you know what I mean? Like yep. as women, we have to find that balance yep. um, between making it who we are and yep. ignoring who we are. And yep. so it's, it's a balance. I think as working women, we've always had to try to strike. And I'm just sort of hyper aware of it this month. Yeah. yeah. And not letting it um, divert your attention. Exactly. As well. And as you said, being laser focused. Um so this last legislative session, you were actually in the role of minority whip um, during the legislative session and just watching you on the floor and, and a lot of the comments that you made from the floor, but also watching you behind the scenes as well, was quite impressive. And um, this session, in my opinion, was the most difficult session, the hardest session, the most harmful session, certainly of any that I've been part of. And this is my, that was my 11th session. Um, but, you know, so there were a lot of um, what we would call low lights, but there were also some highlights. And um, so just kind of what stood out in this session for you, either um, in terms of particular bills or um, other things that happened along the way. Are you wanting highlights first? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> highlights, uh, you know, we, we were able to come together and pass telehealth parity, which means that people who need mental health services and receive them via telehealth, um, the providers will continue to be reimbursed at the same rate as in, in the office, which is critically important for access across the state, particularly in rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a great win for us. That was a house-led win, and so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, we were able to make sure that the fees that are the um, stimulus checks that we got earlier this year that folks received wouldn't be taxed um, so that people could keep more of the money they needed for stimulus. That was a great, a great combination of work. Um, other highlights. <laughs> um, I, I, I did prepare for this. It's just that I'm always so much more aware of the negatives. Um, you know, I think we did some really good work when it comes to making it easier for, um, oh, the adoption support certificate bill. So I love this bill. So this is a bill that um, allows for people who have been adopted to have access to their genuine birth certificate. I mean, I right now, before now, if you were adopted, your, um, your birth certificate had your new parents' names on it, not your birth parents. And so with ancestry and everything, everybody's in DNA tests, everybody's able to find out who their parents were and this allows them to have a true document. And Representative Marty Anderson, who I know is a good friend of the Interfaith Alliance, has really, really led that effort for years. So I was thrilled to have that happen as well. Um, and then, oh, go ahead. 
Um, I was just going to say, and, and you're cutting out a little bit, so we'll see how this goes. But um, um, there were a lot of low points in the, in the session. How's that? Better. That's good. That's great. You know, we've learned to, to uh, be um, very flexible in this day and age. They're cutting out a lot, too. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, any better? It's better on this end. Is it better on your end? Oh, you froze. A little bit. Did I talk more time? Like, talk about lights. Now you froze. Okay, now you're back. Should I hop right back on? Everyone, just a second. <laughs> it's all right. I am not going to do a song and dance for folks, so that is not going to happen. We're gonna leave. There we go. Let's see. Let's see how it goes. You're on my screen. Can you hear me? I, I'm here. I can hear you great. Yeah. All right. Yes. Our business is flexibility, Connie. That's what we That's do. Right. So, <laughs> sorry about um, if, if you didn't know how to be flexible before March of 2020, yeah. you learned how to do it. So. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and certainly everybody understands Wi-Fi issues too. So I know that. Um, so let me just talk for a minute about some of the things that were dangerous or that, that happened this year. Um, you know, we, um, there were, we were a record number of bills that were um, targeting the LGBTQ plus community that were um, cruel and heartless and unnecessary. A lot of legislation this year was really a solution in search of a problem. And so that was really frustrating to me because there were things that weren't issues that um, actually were part of the culture wars that were brought up, you know, and I came up in the early nineties in politics when Pat Robertson was everywhere and it was all the culture wars and it feels like that again. But, um, you know, we had those, like that legislation, fortunately it didn't make it through, which is great. Um, but we also know that they're not done trying. So we're, we're keeping on our toes when it comes to attacks on our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. And then we had, um, more tax on works. We had um, some really difficult stuff when it came to schools. School funding was lower than, uh, the increase in school funding was much lower than it was last year. And we've just been through a pandemic when schools have had to adjust everything they do. Um, the last minute mask ban um, that they did the night of the um, adjournment, which really just sort of surprised everyone and made everybody have to scramble on that day after adjournment that says that you can't require a mask anywhere. An anti-vaccine passport bill when vaccine passports were not a threat. No one was worried about there being vaccine passports, but they wanted to make a statement. And then this diversity plans um, legislation that came out and said um, that there are things you can't talk about in the classroom because they're divisive, um, divisive concepts. So diversity plans was a different thing, but um, there are divisive concepts that can't be talked about in our schools. And I got to tell you, as a journalist, as a professor, um, as an Iowan, the attack on critical thinking is really out of control at the legislature. And it felt felt particularly bad this year. Um, it's really an attack on letting people come to their own conclusions and make up their own minds. And it was incredibly frustrating. Yeah. And um, so kind of diving in a little bit deeper in that, and there was the diversity um, plans bill, which was really targeting and really mean spirited, I think, um, toward five different districts that were trying to control <clears throat> their own um, ability to decide whether students go in and out. So setting that aside, um, I found it fascinating that nowhere in the bill does it talk about critical race theory. And really, there was very little talk on the floor of either chamber around critical race theory. But when the governor um, did finally sign the bill after a couple of weeks, that was her prime focus. And that really also got picked up by the media. And I don't know if there was a shift in um, timing because we hear a lot now at a national level for critical race theory and um, her kind of jumping on board with the popularity of, of attacking that concept. Um, but it was fascinating to me that that um, 
became the became the focus. Not that, not that the bill doesn't have an inference toward that, but right. it, it's not mentioned in the bill. Um, but I think there's also a lot of misconception um, that folks have about what the bill does and what the bill doesn't do, and and um, folks having to to navigate that. My biggest, that's right. And, and critical race theory has become a political buzzword just or buzz phrase, just like all these others. And, you know, as, as we've seen in Iowa, the, um, the majority party and the governor seem to be building on this national um, wave of culture war, um, you know, buzzwords and that kind of stuff, just to divide us a little more and unite their side. And um, so critical race theory was mentioned once on the floor and it was but it's not in the bill, as you mentioned. And it was in reference to the idea that the shocking idea that kids learned that our country was built on stolen land with stolen labor. And um, that concept is not that divisive if you look at the fact that it's it's just inherently true, right? And so they don't want kids to know this. And, and I feel, a lot of us feel like that's not doing kids a good, you know, any favors, have them not understand our roots, not understand where we came from. And, and so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And so. I do believe that they've latched on to critical race theory. Um, it may be what some of them meant all along, but I do believe it's because of the rising tide of this anti-critical race theory movement that really got people um, fired up and allowed our governor to kind of latch onto that. But fundamentally what it does is, I mean, for the party of local control, um, there's a lot of time when local control was taken away this session. And from everything to, you, can, you can't you can let people decide what's safe in their own communities. You can't let schools decide who's gonna be in their school or not. And then you can't let schools teach teachers um, these topics and train on these topics. And that's really, really scary and dangerous. And so I think the misconceptions that are out there are twofold. On one side, it's that a huge problem has been solved now with this banning of critical race theory teaching, which was not being taught. And on the other side, it's thinking that, um, you know, there are just a few divisive concepts we can't teach, but overall, it'll be fine. And I got to tell you, it's pretty muddy. And so the way this is being interpreted really matters at the rules level of the Department of Education. And we don't fully know the impact of what the bill will do. Yeah. And um, a lot of disagreement over, as you said, it's very muddy. And so there's a lot of disagreement over really what the implications are and, and what it does and what it doesn't do. And uh, just reading some news accounts over the weekend of disagreements even between um, Senator Kornbach from Ames and Senator Sinclair Democrat uh, and Republican, and really reading the bill with with different eyes. So it is going to be interesting to see how it how it plays out. And the problem is those who have to carry it out then um, not really understanding what they can do and what they cannot do, and, and not be quote in trouble. Um, right. Well, and so it has a chilling effect, right? It just means yeah. that people are going to err on the side of not teaching it. Yeah. Uh, because they don't want to get in trouble. So even if there's room for them to teach it, if because it's so unclear, they're just going to err on the side of, I don't want to take the risk, which is a disservice to the teacher and to the kids. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to shift gears a little, a little bit to, um, so the session is done, but technically um, not in a way. So there will be a special session. And because you weren't able, the legislature wasn't able to deal with redistricting because of data not coming in from the, the federal government. Um, and so at some point, um, you'll have a special session and, and wondering what you're hearing about that, when that might happen. And the other piece of it, there's a lot of folks that are really worried that Republicans will take advantage of the situation and bring up other bills that they didn't finish um, earlier. And kind of your thoughts on that, if that might happen. Sure. Well, we, we're, we're hearing every possible rumor, right? <laughs> um, and so we don't know. I don't think anybody knows. We know the data will come in in the middle of August. And then um, it will be sent out to the vendor to create these great nonpartisan maps um, that are based on population changes. And then we don't know when we'll get them. And the Constitution says maps have to be drawn by the Supreme Court after September 1st. It's the Constitution. It's not just a rule or a law that can be appended. It's the Constitution. So we're we're not sure exactly what will happen. But, you know, we're hearing that we might have a, a special session in late August. I don't know how that's true. Um, Mid-September could be October. We just don't know. So, um, you know, first of all, 
when this is all going to happen is in question, obviously, because we just don't know when the data comes in, when the maps come in. There's nothing to vote on until we have maps. Right. And then the constitutional question. The second thing is that if we do come back for a special, ses special session, it's certainly my hope that we stick to the business at hand which is to do these maps and move on. Iowans did not give us two sessions so that we can come back and spend a bunch of time and money talking about things just because they didn't get them passed in the regular session. That's not what this special session is for. The special session is only for maps. I mean, of course it can be for anything they want, but, but in theory, it's supposed to be just about maps. And I hope that we're able to stick to that, but I'm hearing rumors already that um, there might be more um, pieces of legislation that they're trying to squeeze in and trying to get done in the special session. I just hope not. Yeah, it, it is going to be fascinating and it's going to be also fascinating to see um, they've made public statements. They're, they're going to stick with the, the process that has been in place and that Iowa is known for um, of not gerrymandering. And so it will be interesting to see um, if they if they hold to that piece as well. So. I certainly hope so. I mean, Iowans expect it. Iowans are proud of our nonpartisan redistricting system. We're one of the best in the country. And there have been statements from our Republicans, Republican colleagues over and over again that they have no plans to um, change the system. The problem is there's a little loophole, which is the third map could give them a chance to change the system or change the maps without changing the system. So uh, we'll just see. You know, I, I just I don't I don't know what to expect, but I've also learned not to be surprised and disappointed. Right. Um. And so I, I just want to remind folks that Interfaith Alliance of Iowa and Action Fund are nonpartisan and um, and we don't endorse candidates. We don't um, endorse parties, but we certainly care about issues from a particular um, perspective, a progressive perspective. And so that oftentimes aligns us with one party or the other, but we do the work regardless and, and we would love both parties to come and join us. So that'd be awesome. So um, I just want to remind folks of that, but we also know that Iowa has swung um, very much to the right over the last few years. And, um, you know, the pendulum always kind of swings back and forth. Sometimes it takes longer um, for, for that to happen. Um, and I heard you say, um, clearly that your main goal is to um, be laser focused on um, having a majority in the House. Um, and so, you know, I'm interested in that and um, kind of your perspective of this shift that has happened over the last years and, and the harm that it has created for everyday Iowans and kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah. I, one of the things that, um, you know, this is the state that I grew up in, as I mentioned. And so I've seen this state be such a good progressive leader on so many really important issues. And so it's so disappointing to see us heading in a different direction. I believe we can still be veered back toward the center a little bit, but, um, and that's really what I'm trying to, where I'm trying to get us is back to some balance, right? To some accountability up at the Capitol. Um, and so by having at least one chamber in the other party's control, it does bring that accountability by design, right? Because you've got divided control or the governor's office or whatever. So um, that's what we're trying to get to. I think that um, there are two changes that are happening right now and redistricting will really draw a line here. So in my district, for example, in 2016, when I lost, there were five more registered Republicans than Democrats in my district and I lost by 500 votes. Um, now there are 2000 more Democrats than Republicans in my district. That's five years later. Um, it has been just a huge switch um, from Republican to Democrat in the suburbs. I'm like the quintessential suburb that has changed, like that you hear about on the news. So there are changes that are happening as suburbs start to turn bluer, that then um, redder districts, though, um, across the state are becoming less blue because those people have moved to the suburbs, right? So concentrations of population. With redistricting, um, we'll see an adjustment to some extent, right, over in population centers. Whereas right now, because of population changes over the last 10 years, one district might have, you know, 20,000 people when it's supposed to have 30, and one district might have 40,000 people when it's supposed to have 30. So the hope would be that some of those more congested areas where people are growing, where populations are growing, get divided up, and then we can see more opportunity for some more common sense, blue district, progressive kind of um, candidates and voices coming forward. So that's actually a good thing for me. For me, I know, you know, Interfaith Alliance is nonpartisan. I did not mean to put you in a bad spot. I am not nonpartisan. So I'm all in. I was 
Um, but so I think that will that will help a little bit. But at the end of the day, we as Democrats have to do a better job of reminding people in those areas that have just turned from blue to red or purple to red that Democrats are the party of working people. Democrats are the party that put your family first. Democrats are the party that want to make sure that you're that you are well taken care of and that you have jobs and education and health care. And those things are critically important. Those common sense kitchen table issues. We just need to make sure we're talking to people in those districts and reminding them that we're the ones who walk the walk. They can talk the talk, but they campaign in moderation and govern in extreme. And we campaign on who we are, and then we try to govern the same way. So we feel like we're not doing nearly as much of a bait and switch as the majority party is. And we feel like people in some of these areas aren't being well served by the people representing them. Because when they get to Des Moines, they vote for things they never talked about. On the, on the campaign trail. So that's really our job. And that's why I'm going around the state and talking to people too, is because I think it's important to get out of Des Moines and talk with Iowans where they are and hear what they need and remind them that Democrats can provide it for them. And, um, and when I invite a partisan person, I understand that we're going to get into partin partisan um, issues and questions. So um, it, if folks have a concern about that, they can certainly call me. Um, and um, and we do try and invite Republicans onto the, this also as well to have the conversation. Ha haven't had anybody take me up on that, but I um, would love for that to happen. Um, sure. And so if we if we connect the dots in these conversations, you're, you know, you're going around to a lot of different communities, um, urban, suburban, rural, um, small town, middle size, all of those pieces. Um, how do you connect the dots of, of um, who's in power and not having a divided power in particular and that, that idea of balance and accountability that, that you talked about and the outcome of harmful legislation, divisive legislation, um, but, but particularly harmful legislation that hurts everyday Iowans. How do you, how do you get folks, and, and really, how can folks who are listening um, have those conversations as well of, of connecting the dots, um, who's in power, making decisions, and then some of the harmful legislation that we're seeing or legislation that we're not seeing that's being ignored as well. Right. I mean, and so connecting the dots is what I'm trying to do. It's the exact phrase I keep using. I'm looking for what I call fireworks moments. So in 2017, you might remember that um, the Iowa legislature passed um, and legalized fireworks in communities um, around the state. And on the 4th of July that year, I remember sitting in my house on Facebook on the 4th of July and seeing people just going off about how mad they were about the fireworks. And they're like, who did this? Who allows this to happen? And then people were posting the names of state senators and state representatives and saying, call them and tell them you're mad they did this. I want to do that for, for things that have a real impact on everyday Iowans lives, right? So did you have trouble getting health care today? Here's why. Um, are there, you know, are there fewer state troopers on the road? It's because we've underfunded them, right? I mean, did someone, you know, get attacked at a prison in Iowa? It's because we've chronically underfunded our, um, our correctional facilities. So trying to draw those lines for people between something that they didn't want to happen and the policy that either allowed it or made it possible or, or, or made it impossible or created it. So that's really what I'm trying to do. So I wish it was always as easy as the fireworks because those are loud and annoying and their dog's mad and then you can make the connection. But um, so we're trying to make those dots, you know, connected on things that aren't going great for you. Let's talk about what Democrats have proposed because we're not just about opposing things. We've proposed a lot of things and how can we show that those things didn't even get a conversation on the floor, right? We tried to fix this. This is what happened. So making those connections. But then secondly, making the connections for what's happening in Washington in a good way. So that people can see that Democrats are delivering for them at the national level and what could happen here in Iowa. So, for example, um, the, you know, Sean Patrick Maloney, the congressman from New York, often says, you know, did you get a vaccine? Thank a Democrat. They made it happen. Did you get a stimulus check? Thank a Democrat. They made it happen. Did you get are you going to get um, more money in your bank this week because of child care tax credit that's coming to Iowa families automatically? Democrats did that. And reminding people that Congresswoman Axney, President Biden have been doing this work, and that's the kind of work we want to do here in Iowa. So it's really a twofold dot connection, as it were, right? Like the positives that are happening, what could happen, and the impact of what has happened, um, what is happening. Yeah. Um, I, 
I'm interested in knowing um, when folks, so we're out of legislative session time other than redistricting potentially coming up. And um, folks often think that legislators who are citizen legislators, they're not paid to be full-time, but really it is another full-time job. Um, and they they only think, think of legislature during those four or five months sometimes six, but anyway, um, and contacting them then. But outside of legislative time is also a really great time for folks to talk with their, their lawmakers about particular issues. And so um, how do folks approach that? How should folks approach that in terms of um, talking with their legislators? It's actually easier to talk to our constituents now than it is during the legislative session. Um, and that's because we're back in district, we're where we're home, and sometimes some of us have office hours where we'll just, you know, come meet me at the library from 12 to 2. Some of us have um, conversations about, uh, you know, we, we sit down and have coffee with constituents or we'll go to events in the community. Friday night, I'm going to um, Clive Fest in Clive and I'll talk with folks there. Um, you know, so this is actually the time when we're back in district doing the constituent work that we want to be doing when we're at the Capitol, but don't have time because the days are so packed. So uh, now is the time to just reach out to your state representative, shoot her an email. Um, shoot her, you know, give her a phone call and ask her if you can sit down and have a 20 minute, 30 minute meeting with her about things that matter to you. Send an email now about things that you hope to see next session or laws that just went into effect on July 1st that you're upset went into effect, right? Let her know what you think now when, um, you know, my inbox is never nearly as full in the summer, which is great, but, um, right. and, and, and this is the time when I really have to listen. So a lot of the important groundwork is laid between May and December um, because that's when we have the conversations about what bills will be coming up once session starts. Yeah, it's a really a great opportunity to engage. And if you've never met your lawmaker, your legislator, senator, or yes, yeah, senator or um, your representative, this is a perfect time to do that, and and they can really focus more on on the issues. Anything else that you want, Representative Jennifer Conforst, um, that you want folks to know about um, of the the work that you're doing around the state um, or um, what, what folks can expect from you as the, the leader of the Democratic Party in the House? Sure. You know, I think the biggest thing is just that, um, you know, Democrats are energized and ready to go. We kind of had a, we had a pretty terrible 2020 here in Iowa. Um, and the 2021 session was pretty rough. But um, as I keep telling my caucus, caucus and my colleagues, it's time to get up off the mat and get to work. And we've been working, but we're ready to focus, right? Like I keep saying we can learn the lessons of 2020 without living in 2020. So it's time now to get out there and have conversations with people and really listen to what Iowans want. We might be pleasantly surprised, and I have been so far, about how much of what we believe in is what Iowans are looking for. And we just need to really do a good job of communicating to them what it is that we stand for and why um, we're the kind of community leaders they want. But at the end of the day, um, you need to know that even in this 2020 session, 2022 session, even during the special session, Democrats are here to continue to fight and hold um, the majority party accountable and try to do all we can to stop bad legislation. What that means is that we're voting against it. We're working with our Republican colleagues to show them the impact. And the people of Iowa who contact their legislators make a difference. There's a reason we don't have school vouchers. That was a bill that came out of this legislative session. There's a reason we don't have all these anti-LGBTQ bills because of Iowans who've contacted their legislators and told them what they think. So keep doing that because you're the backup we need in the chamber to help stop some of this nonsense. That is awesome. And and um, I am grateful for your work um, in the legislature and your leadership and look forward to um, seeing that um, over the next uh, many years um, in in different ways. And um, and I'm grateful for all the advocates who have used their voice. We worked on um, all of those pieces of legislation that you talked about and folks who follow Interfaith Alliance and I want to engage with us. Um, I know they were on a daily basis using their voice and contact 
attacking legislators. So um, we are inviting, just to clarify, we are inviting Republicans to um, be part of this and and have a conversation and, and um, we'll keep you updated on whether or not anybody takes us up on, on that offer. Um, next week, we're going to talk about critical race theory um, with uh, Reverend Dr. Jennifer, um, I just watched her thing. Yeah. Her, her, her colleague of mine. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's the Drake month, evidently. Yes. And she's a friend and like it just went out of my head. Anyway, sorry. Um, and we're going to talk about critical race theory and what it really means and what it doesn't mean. So that's going to be an interesting conversation. Hope folks will come back. In the meantime, thank you, Representative Jennifer Confrest, for joining me today. And for everybody who is watching online, if you are new to us and just found us, you can find us on other social media platforms, Instagram um, and Twitter. And you can also find our website at interfaithalliance.iowa.org and um, learn more about our work. It is our 25th anniversary and we will continue to um, be part of the conversation um, for probably, hopefully, many years to come. So um, in the meantime, thank you, Representative Conference. Really appreciate it. And um, to folks who are watching, I always say at the end, um, please register to vote if you are not already registered to vote. And if you are, then please help somebody else to register to vote in our democracy. It truly matters. And in the meantime, stay safe and take care and have a great week. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.